Okay, we're going to get started. I asked the people that are not yet seated because they're still getting coffee to just please be quiet. Uh, that would be amazing. So I'm going to uh, quickly pass this off to Olivia Neal, but we're super excited to have a panel of diverse, both uh, business-led, uh, open practitioners, and uh, also technologists. So it'll be a pretty diverse and great discussion, which I think builds off of some of the keynotes that we had today, including one of our keynotes. So Liv, <laughs> uh, if you want to get started and have everybody introduce themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, merci à tous les membres du panel d'être ici aujourd'hui. Nous avons un vaste gamme d'expériences et de points de vue. Uh, and I'd like to just start by asking everybody to give a very brief introduction to themselves. We only have half an hour, and I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of experience. So I'm going to ask all the panel members to keep uh, answers relatively tight, although I think we could talk for a really long time. But if we could just start by a very brief introduction. Uh, Melanie, maybe we could start with you. Hello, everybody. Hello, I'm Melanie Robert. I'm Executive Director of Open Government at the Treasury Board Secretariat of Canada. Treasury Board Secretariat is the body in government that actually has the carrots and the sticks to make all the departments comply uh, <laughs> with um, um, directions. So it's a pretty powerful place. Um, and my job is to make a government uh, open. Just generally, so we, I have, um, uh, we have a site called open.canada.ca that is open source, so I guess that's why I'm here today. Um, hi there, my name is Sean Boots, and I'm on the policy team with the Canadian Digital Service, which is a new team within the Federal Treasury Board. Um, our, our role is to partner with federal departments to help improve uh, online government services and to really bring in and mainstream modern practices from the tech world into government. Um, so before this, I worked as a full stack developer for a startup in West Africa, uh, building tools for international development research. And uh, yeah, it's really neat to be at this sort of intersection of technology and public policy here. Hi, I'm Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Pierre-Antoine Ferron. I'm, to make it short, I'm sort of an advisor to the CIO of the city of Montreal. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, our, our R&D program at universities and uh, research centers and also uh, specialists in uh, IT governance. So that's about it. Thank you. All admirably brief. Um, and myself, my name is Olivia Neal. I also work at the Treasury Board Secretariat within the Office of the Chief Information Officer. And I've been in Canada for just over a year now. Uh, prior to this, I worked for the Government Digital Service in the UK. Um, so just to start off by putting ourselves in a little bit of context, um, le Canada est bien respecté à l'échelle internationale pour notre rôle dans le domaine de le gouvernement ouvert. Uh, depuis 2012, soit la même année que nous avons lancé la portail du gouvernement ouvert, nous sommes membres actifs du partenariat pour un gouvernement ouvert. Nous sommes fiers d'assumer la présidence de ce groupe cette année. Nous sommes ravis d'animer le sommet global qui se tiendra le printemps prochain. Et récemment, on a annoncé que le Canada était le premier, selon le baromètre global, sur les données ouvertes. So we have an excellent reputation worldwide in terms of open government and open data. We really genuinely are seen as a world leader. Canada is very respected in this space. And it was interesting for me listening to Kirsten when you were talking so enthusiastically about the Web Experience Toolkit, about the brilliant work that's going on in Canada. One of the things that has struck me since I've been here is how incredibly humble all you Canadians are. There are brilliant things going on in this community. We're going to talk a bit about how we build a community and how we do that. But this community is already here in a really big space and I think I'd just like to recognize the really hard work of people that has been going on for many years to get us to this space. People like Guillaume, people like Sebastian and many others who have already built up this community because we're now in a space where we have the President of the Treasury Board standing up and getting behind this. We have the CIO of the Government of Canada getting behind this. People have your backs for making these changes, and this is a time for this community really to start thriving and driving things forward across the whole government, rather than this being a kind of niche area. So with that in mind, I wanted to start with Kirsten, if I may. Um, what you've been doing in the US sounds so exciting in building this community. 
Can you tell us a little bit about what were the things that helped the most? What are the things that have helped you kind of scale this and get forward up? get forward on it. And also, there was one thing, if, if I realize I've, I've asked you to a short answer, but I'm not going to ask you a very big question. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that Congress were very nervous about this. And I think that's something that we, we often face is nervousness and maybe misunderstanding. Has there been anything you could share which has helped uh, alleviate some of those concerns? So I'll start with the second question first. Um, what I was alluding to was a project called OSERA. And you can look this up on the web. It's called the gold standard. And what it was was a way to talk to Congress and the staffers back in 2010 about open source projects, um, open source software. The big fear among most of the, the folks that we had to deal with was that China or Russia or whoever, anonymous even, would insert malicious code and that we would just accept it and then put it into our systems. They didn't understand how testing works or, or how we incorporate code. They just didn't understand any of that stuff. And it's really difficult to explain branching and forking and um, Git in general to anyone who doesn't work in tech, to be honest with you. It's pretty amazing that this entire event was on Git. I think that was really cool. Um, on the first question, the, the idea of building a community around open source projects. Um, with Drupal for Gov, it came out of our need to collaborate across lines and an inability for any of us techies to actually talk to each other. So we built it ourselves. And as time has gone by, one of the things that I, I think got a 15 today was about having government employees be able to dedicate their time to open source projects. And we do that. So most of the members of our team who are either in the nonprofit sector or government sector actually have it in their performance evaluations and performance standards to contribute to an open source project. Specifically, most of us use it for um, Drupal for Gov in order to run our event and all of our um, webinars and half days and whatever, um, because it takes a lot of our time. I probably work 10 to 15 percent of my actual time just on Drupal for Gov. And my agency likes that about me, right? until they move to WordPress, and then I don't know what I'm going to do. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But a, a lot of the other agencies do the same thing, whether it's NIST or Commerce. It's actually incorporated into their performance standards. Thank you. I think, um, I think that, that idea of incorporating something uh, within performance standards, within the way that we measure things, could be a, a really useful tool for us kind of getting some traction. Um, Sean, you're with the Canadian Digital Service, um, and the Canadian Digital Service are really, uh, I think, trying to show what is possible in this space. And I think you're operating, um, I, I know it doesn't seem like this sometimes, but I think you're operating in an environment where you may have more freedoms or you're testing the boundaries a bit more than, than people in departments might be able to. Could you tell us a bit about what, uh, what you've learned from that experience, any practical tips you've got, how you're, how you're really putting this into practice? Yeah, so, so our team, since the beginning, we've adopted a 100% open source sort of practice for the software that we build. We do a lot of custom service design work with departments. And it's sort of something that, for us, was just sort of a natural evolution from how other similar teams around the world have approached this thing, where if you look at the government digital service in the UK, where Olivia used to work, 100% open source, the USDS, the US Digital Service, or 18F in the United States, very similar approach. And for us, it's sort of, there's, there's three really sort of key parts of that. One is that it avoids vendor lock-in, which for us is a really important priority. It's sort of, if we wanted to switch from one, you know, framework to the next, or one cloud provider to the next, or one sort of like backend system to the next. Using open source tools makes that much, much easier. Often it's otherwise completely impossible. So that's, that's one of the key priorities. The other one is that there's a huge ecosystem of really, really valuable tools out there. Libraries, frameworks, all sorts of systems that are part of this really large open source ecosystem. And it's sort of to the point that you made earlier, it's sort of, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel with the things that we built. If we're looking for a logging system or like a load balancer or any kind of database layer. The people that have built these as open source products come from some of the best tech companies around the world. And so by being able to just sort of take the world class things that they built and run with it, then we can focus our time on the things that really solve problems that are unique to government. If we can start 
80% done by using open source, then we can focus on perfecting the things that are really unique to a government setting or to the users that we have. Um, and then the third thing about open source, especially using open source as you're building something in real time, that's, that's a huge culture change for government, but that's something that our team is doing where you can actually watch on our organization's GitHub as, as people are coding every single day. You'll see their pull requests come in, you'll see everyone commenting on each other's work. It's, it's, it's a really interesting sort of transparency approach, but it also does something really interesting for team culture, because when you're working with that much visibility, you really need to bring your A game. It's something that really forces us to sort of, you know, do our best work at all times, which is a really interesting sort of challenge to run with. And, and it's interesting because, of course, there's sort of, Dr. Fielding had some really important points this morning about how do you build communities around open source. And he mentioned how open source is just a license. It's not magic pixie dust. Um, but the sort of, the sort of, <laughs> sounds cheesy, but sort of like, if you're working as a developer and the world can look at your code, that forces you to do your best work. And sort of like, the magic pixie dust, it's in you. It's like, that's like, that like, <laughs> It's like, it's in you, it's not in the license. And by working in the open, it forces us to do our, our best work that we'd be really proud of to have on the world stage, even if no one ever looks at it, just the possibility that someone might. It's very different than sort of like the stereotype of, you know, we've all been there, sort of like the IT developer in the basement. You know, you write some code, no one will ever see it. It just barely works, well, that's fine. But in, our, in this case, it really forces us to build as close to world-class software as we can. And working in the open is a really important way of achieving that. Thank you. Um, so building on that kind of theme of working in the open, um, Melanie, um, dans le gouvernement du Canada, nous avons maintenant un ensemble de normes uh, numériques uh, et l'une de ces normes est de travailler ouvertement par défaut. Um, je crois que ici, dans cette salle, il est probable que nous, que nous pensons qu'il s'agisse d'une bonne chose, mais en réalité, uh, cette approche peut être uh, un peu difficile. Um, tu as travaillé beaucoup dans cette domaine. Um, Pourrais-tu parler de certains des défis auxquels uh, tu as été confronté? Je vais répondre en français et je vais traduire aussi en anglais. La question était, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing when trying to convince people to work um, out in the open? Mon travail, moi, c'est vraiment d'essayer de convaincre les, les exécutifs au sein du gouvernement d'embrasser de cette nouvelle culture de l'ouverture et ces, tous ces processus d'ouverture. So my job is to convince all executives to really start embracing open in uh, their culture and their processes. And it is really, really hard. Um, on a commencé beaucoup avec les données ouvertes parce que d'une certaine façon, c'était plus petit uh, et les gens comprenaient, mais déjà ça, ça a été très, très dur. So starting with open data was a natural starter because it was kind of, it seems circumscribed, but still, that, that was super hard. Um, he, uh, open source was like this secret community, the secret society. Like, I remember when I started, I almost never mentioned that the site was open source for fear that my bosses would say, what? Um, quand j'ai commencé, que le fait que mon site soit code sur ouvert, le logiciel libre, c'était presque quelque chose que je cachais. Uh, fast forward now, like this is now a standard for us. Like people uh, in government now have to explain why not um, when they're not doing open source. C'est que beaucoup, beaucoup de changements depuis uh, où vraiment les gens qui font de la technologie au sein du gouvernement se font maintenant demander, mais, mais pourquoi pas? Pourquoi pas faire uh, code source ouvert? Il reste que ça pose de nombreux problèmes parce que les exécutifs de haut niveau, qui sont souvent les gens qui font la décision à la fin, ont encore beaucoup, beaucoup euh, d'appréhension. Euh, face euh, au logiciel libre. Euh, on a encore des craintes beaucoup reliées au risque. On a l'impression que c'est quelque chose qui est un petit peu hippie, là, qui n'est pas très... Euh, c'est quoi cette affaire-là? Il euh, y a un gros problème aussi pour aller chercher euh, des, des, du talent. Vraiment, on n'a pas encore beaucoup de talent à l'intérieur euh, euh, du gouvernement là-dessus. Puis, c'est un gros, gros changement que les gens ne sont pas prêts encore à, à, à accepter. Je vais en parler un petit peu plus tard. Puis, en fait, j'espère que toute cette communauté-là peut être très consciente de ces trois problèmes-là parce qu'on doit vraiment être conscient que les exécutifs qui vous accueillent, vous, les entrepreneurs, ont ces problèmes-là. So, the, the three big problems that we have, of course, is it's perceived as riskier. It's still perceived as a hippie thing, kind of, like weird, you know, kind of. 
and, and people are not sort of ready to embrace that yet. And, and there even security aspect or the fact that this iteration and that you're going to do that out in the open, that's pretty scary for a lot of executives. They're, and, and it's a change that I'd say executives have to face also in working out in the open more generally. It's this shift about we're going to go out there and it may not be perfect and we're going to shift halfway through and that's really hard for government because for years we were just going out when everything was perfect or so we thought. Um, the second one is people. Uh, it's really hard to have talent in open source and government because I guess outside you have nicer, more interesting work than, than we have had so far. It's very difficult, it's really hard for us to commit to open source knowing that we're not going to have the resources. And it's a change. It's really different than how they've always done their work. So those are the, some of the three big challenges and you should be aware of those and make sure that you, when you pitch something um, that you come equipped to talk about these three things and how your project is, is aware of these problems and is going to try to solve them. Merci. Um, Pierre-Antoine, uh, bonjour. Uh, la Ville de Montréal a récemment publié votre politique uh, sur l'utilisation et développement uh, des logiciels et des matériels libres. Um, à ton avis, quel est, quel est ton meilleur conseil pour, pour quelqu'un qui veut travailler uh, dans une manière ouverte. What's, what's your best advice you would give to people who want to follow the lead of, of the policy that you're setting out? Well, I've got, there are several <laughs> precautionary pre <laughs> things you have to do. I'm, I concur with my colleague uh, with the, uh, of the federal administration. Uh, we had a lot of education to do, but not uh, towards our politician, to our, our, towards our high level uh, people who decide, but uh, at, we have traditionally very close relations uh, with the EU, uh, and we've been discussing uh, for uh, several years with Paris, uh, Britain, uh, and uh, France, uh, Germany, and the EU. So we have basically the same uh, philosophy about open source than them. So uh, security is not a, an issue for us. Uh, it act actually, we think it's more secure uh, because you know the code. That's one of the first things. So uh, wh the main problem we have, for example, where I procurement governance for IT. So we decided before, two years before our policy was um, uh, published, uh, we decided to uh, make it mandatory that all uh, architecture or software analysis uh, done uh, contains mandatory cr analysis criteria uh, pertaining, you know, to determine if we're going to go on RFP or not. Uh, so th this paid a lot, and we consider ROI because we do our TCO analysis. Uh, to sort of, uh, well, partly to quiet the bean counters, uh, but uh, also we, we do our business, that, you know, we make business decision. Centrally uh, in Montreal, you, you probably know we're very disruptive and we like that because we work with our citizens when we do uh, public applications, not only do we evaluate what our citizens want, but when we put something online, they're invited to test it. Uh, actually, we've got, uh, I think it's 1,200 uh, volunteer testers uh, for our online applications. Uh, same thing, uh, UX is central uh, to uh, developing an application. We do that with citizens and we do it internally. Uh, when we use open source, basically, we think open source is the, one of the best ways to help industry in a level playing field way, because we don't like to practice corporate welfare uh, and even less uh, vendor lock-in. We call that uh, a loose translation is a $100 million brides. Uh, so if you've, got to, you've got to love them a lot, if you, and if you quit, it's going to cost you dearly. So uh, it's mandatory. All, all um, uh, procurement decisions are made by IT. Nobody has the right to buy anything without uh, going through uh, IT analysis, security analysis, and TCO analysis. So 
and, uh, although we're a little microbe compared to <laughs> the government of Canada, we try to do uh, our business. When we did our policy, we reviewed 30 national policies and we picked and choose what suited us. Uh, we didn't apply it uh, like that. And lo and behold, our friends uh, from Canada called us and, okay, we'll, we're generous. Actually, we're doing something nobody else does is open hardware and uh, open science. Uh, because we think since we use the money of the you know, taxpayers, they, it's right that they know they have a result and they can consult it. It shows that a good use of uh, government money. So practically, and I'll finish with that, uh, when we develop open source, it's when markets are, are not there because we know it's going to answer uh, business needs or needs of citizens and then you know, have a good effect, uh, all, not only for the city, but it's built in our, in our approach that any other city in Canada can use it. So that's, that's a bit of our philosophy. I think I have so many questions on that, but one I just really wanted to pick up on is um, you talk about open source hardware, which I think is really interesting because it's not a phrase or a, a kind of topic area we talk about much, and I, I wondered if you could just explain what you mean by that. Easily. Uh, as open source is an integral part uh, of our smart city uh, strategy, basically you can't do a smart government or smart city without open source. Okay, because markets are not targeted for government needs generally. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, specifically on open hardware, uh, for example, uh, it's as simple as we have cabinets for uh, traffic control. We had them made by universities. So those are go the plans are going to be released for everybody to use because other cities, for example, in, in our province, they, they call us and say, can you give us the plan? So we uh, uh, provide the license so that nobody can sell the plans. They can build it. So it's for common good. As for open science, uh, uh, our strategy for smart cities is to work closely with universities for applied R&D to resolve problems that you know, we encounter. Uh, and uh, we figured that, okay, uh, let's do that in Creative Commons license and uh, publish it. And even even we're not obligated at all to translate our uh, research in, uh, from French to English. We decided it has so much value uh, that uh, that uh, we not only we publish it, we send it to all cities, uh, large cities in Canada. And that was really disruptive for them because they said. Why are you doing this? Is where is there the strength attached? No, no, we just want to kill you with kindness. That's basically, that's basically our attitude. Be generous because it's going to to come back to you always. Because after that, if I call somebody in Edmonton, for example, oh, you're the guy from Montreal. Oh, yeah, okay, can we talk together? And we started to work. And basically, what what we found is civil servants from any administration are really generous. Okay, and we have to table on that, you know, to, to m have multiplying effects. First step is to know in open source who works on what, who uses what. That's one of the first thing and have a clear vision of where we want to be in five years for our citizens. I'd love to pick up on that, can I? Yes. I think this is the transformative power of open source. Like It's a game changer, and the way I explain it, and if you have to explain it to your clients or to your upper echelon, is this ability to build on something rather than reinvent every time and then to collaborate in a true win-win situation. That's, that's not something that normally we ex experience um, in policy, in government. When you're going FedProv, it's you or I, and it's win and lose. And for us in OpenGov and with open source, we're building off of each other. So it's win, win, and build on top of it. So it's th this tremendous power to accelerate our development as governments, but as a society, uh, that's transformative. And open source has been doing it with, like, without really saying it. Um, like I had a, a higher up come to me and say, like in a panic, um, do we crowdsource? And I'm like, oh, God, where do I start? You know, that's like just the, you know, they, they don't understand that this is a new word 
for the policy community. Yeah. Oh, we should crowdsource. And it's like, yeah, there's people that have been yeah, working like this from the get-go. Like, it's a way of life. I'm sorry, if I could build on what you're saying. Uh, actually, uh, I've got to commend the federal government about GC Collab and opening it. Uh, our cities were looking to network together, our IT departments. And I think within one month, uh, we had uh, uh, 62 cities, IT departments to exchange practices, studies, start project group on, for example, uh, cybersecurity and stuff like that. So action speaks volumes. Uh, is the platform uh, perfect? Certainly, certainly not. Uh, is, are the ways to patrol it uh, perfectable? Yes, but it speaks volume. It means. Okay, the, the federal government truly, and that was the reaction uh, of several CIOs, oh, this time they really mean business. Uh, so let's pump, and we were invited into several groups, and let's pump principles, let's pump our research. And furthermore than that, we all uh, saw that, oh, they also listen. That's great. That's a good, good attitude. Keep, keep it up. So I can see I'm being subtly given a hint that the panel have three and a half minutes left. So um, I, I think it's here. I think we, we have much more we could talk about. But I'm going to end just by asking everybody uh, if they could um, give one piece of advice to the people in this room today to when they go away, something to do, something to think about, a change to make, uh, what would it be? Um, and I'm going to start with Sean because you're great at thinking up things on the spot. No pressure. Um, yeah, so I'd say there's across across the federal government, there's more and more sort of communities building around a policy community, communications community practice. I think one of the things that today sort of like seeing everyone here really reflects is that there's, I think there's sort of like this unmet sort of need for a stronger community of developers, IT team leaders across the CS community, the IS community. A lot of people are working on these kinds of things and finding ways to connect to each other and also to connect to the wider world. Like often it feels like the digital government community, you know, people doing amazing work in the UK or people doing amazing work in the States or Australia. If you're a developer, your day is so packed and you're sort of like, you know, stuck working on your giant legacy application that it's hard to take the time to actually learn from these communities that are out there. So whether it's on Twitter or GC Collab or other sort of, you know, there's a cross Canada Slack community. There's lots of resources out there to get connected to this bigger world. And there's so much that we can all learn from that. So I think that's, I think there's a, there's a huge potential there for sure. Thank you. And um, Kirsten. So my big takeaway, or I think you should all um, take away from this experience, is um, so I'm looking at the audience right now. I'd like to actually know how many of you have worked on the Web Experience Toolkit. Stand up. Please stand up. Please, please, please stand up. I saw more hands than that. You're all not standing up. That is an absolutely amazing feat that you've pulled off because you did this literally years ago. This is not a new project. But all of you worked on it. That's amazing. Some of you in government, some of you out of government, some of you just wanting to help government be better. And honestly, instead of my takeaway always as a government employee and as a developer, I am not a manager, I'm not a senior leader. I'm a developer, and I would prefer to stay a developer. So at my level, being able to reach out to other developers is a massive, massive improvement. And for me, it doesn't matter if the senior leadership comes along or not. I hope they will, but I believe in these people up here, being able to bring them along once we've already created the community. I think having that community and being able to say, oh yeah, we've been doing this since 2014. I think 2013. When did Web Experience Toolkit start, anybody? 2012, 2013? That is insane. <laughs> that is so far cutting edge and you did it all in the open. Honestly, round of applause for that. Uh, Pierre-Antoine, what, what would you like to add for people to take away as a, as a message or a, an action after today? Be like the ocean. The ocean vanquishes uh, cliffs and stuff like that. You've got to go for the long run. 
you've got to make alliances because open source is also a political thing, okay, both internally and on the uh, on the real world, for example, okay, and there are extraordinary things that we could do with that with our citizens. Think about climate change, for example. Uh, what we could do in open source, open hardware with IoT to measure really what's going on in our cities. So it's a duty for a civil servant to have at least a, an interest in open source and what it can do. I love that. It's a, a duty for all of us to think about our part And I'm going to give the last word to Melanie. No pressure. So uh, two big piece of advice for those of you trying to get open source in government, talking to your clients or talking to your bosses. First, pacify the fear. They are fearful. Some of them think that you're all a bunch of hippies, that this is haphazard. Address it head on. Coders are people, are some of the most structured, planned people. Talk about that. Talk about there's a method behind what seems to them like a madness. So address it up front. And second, explain the big picture. This is about collaborating. This is about accelerating progress um, because they need to understand the inspiration behind the movement, not just the technicalities. Address the fear, talk big picture. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the members. Thank you. Of the Thank panel. you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much to the panel. So